Now, so far on the programme, we've heard quite a lot from people with suggestions, some more critical than others, uh, for the government. So now it's time to talk to the man who's been leading the response while the Prime Minister recovers from coronavirus, the Foreign Secretary and the First Secretary of State, Dominic Raab. Thank you for being with us uh, today. Now, Good morning. Thanks, Sophie. More than 20,000 people have now died in hospital after testing positive for COVID-19. 20 thousand i mean now last month the chief scientific advisor said keeping the number below 20,000 would be a good outcome for the uk this is clearly a bad one worse than we were hoping for foreign secretary are you worried look I, this has been an incredibly worrying time and uh, the fact that we've passed that grim milestone of 20,000 uh, of course is heartbreaking for every one of those who've lost loved ones. Uh, we know though that this has been an unprecedented crisis. I don't think you can blame the chief medical officers who were pressed uh, repeatedly to try and put an estimate on uh, how long it would take, how many people would pass away. What we do know is as we go through the peak of this crisis, two critical things have happened which were part of our plan. The first one is as we go through we've flattened the peak because the public have followed the social distancing guidelines very carefully. That has been successful and, and I'm afraid it's the reality that the death toll would have been even higher if we hadn't have introduced those measures at the right time and frankly if the public hadn't have been overwhelmingly supportive of those measures. The second critical thing is that we've made sure we've got the critical care capacity in the NHS, the ventilators, the, uh, the, the, the ICU capacity to deal with this crisis at its peak and that means that the NHS hasn't been overwhelmed and has has been able to cope not just with coronavirus but also the other critical uh, care needs that people have. But as we come through this crisis, we're at a delicate and dangerous stage, and we need to make sure the next steps are sure footed, which is why we're proceeding very cautiously and we're sticking uh, to the medical advice, the scientific advice, with the social distancing measures at this time, whilst doing all of the homework, if you like, to make sure that we're prepared in due course for the next phase. You're talking about the next steps there, you're talking about the next phase. Um, Nicola Sturgeon has had what she calls a grown-up conversation about how that might look in Scotland when some of the lockdown measures do end up uh, changing. We just heard Andy Burnham do the same. Why don't you trust people enough to tell them what it is that you're considering? Well, we do. We set out five tests. I set them out about 10 days ago, which said we're coming through the peak of this crisis, but until we've got, frankly, the, the death rate down, until we've got the uh, infection rate down, until we can be confident that we uh, don't end up precipitating a second peak in the virus, which would uh, cause more deaths, which would damage the economy, which would result in a second lockdown. And as Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, said this week, would actually result in a big blow, not just to the economy, but to public confidence until we can be confident, based on the scientific advice, that we'll make sure-footed steps going forward, which protect life but also preserve our way of life. Frankly, it's not responsible to start uh, speculating about the individual measures. And I read uh, Nicola Sturgeon's uh, Scottish Government report on this, and it's 25 pages long, and it sticks very carefully and, and, and consistently to the five tests that we've set out. And so we'll be guided by the scientific advice, and we want to make sure that uh, as we approach the point at which we can make changes, we're guided by the science and, as I said, overwhelmingly taking care of the health of the public, but also making sure we take sure-footed steps. I think anything else is irresponsible. And frankly, for all the other people that are saying that we should be uh, setting out proposals in detail, I haven't actually seen any of those particular people suggesting specific things. And, and I think they're right not to at this stage, because until we've got the evidence from the scientists and the scientific groups, and also until we've tested what, what uh, those proposals would uh, the impact they would have, I don't think it would be a responsible thing to do. It would only create more uncertainty in the public's mind when actually they need the reassurance that we're taking the right measures, as I said, based on the evidence at the right time. It's not a bit patronising, though, saying that it would just create more uncertainty for the public. I mean, the public have really followed the guidance. Surely they're intelligent enough to work out that what you're laying out isn't things that they can expect to do right now. 
Well, actually, if you look at the public mood, it's overwhelmingly they're concerned that we might ease up too soon. But let me just give you an illustration. If we started proposing one or other measure that subsequently down the track we found out we couldn't implement, I think we, you'd be saying that we'd jump the gun. You'd be criticising us for that. And I think the public would be getting mixed messaging. So what we've said very clearly is we've set out the five tests what the next transitional phase would look like. It won't be just going back, it will be a new normal, if you like, with social distancing measures adapted to areas which are currently closed off. Um, and we'll make sure we're guided by the scientific evidence. And the scientists themselves have said, uh, when I set out those five tests 10 days ago, they said easing up on any of the measures now would be dangerous and irresponsible. And they also said that in about three weeks' time from that point, so another couple of weeks, they'd have more evidence. And of course, the more we get the rate of deaths down, the more we get the rate of infections down, the greater flexibility we'll have. So we'll take the right, right decisions. But, but I just make this point, the Andrew Bailey, Governor of the Bank of England, made this point as well. If we take the wrong measures now, it's not just the risk to public health, also the risk to the economy because we'd get a second spike, a second lockdown and that would be a serious blow to public confidence. So we're going to take the right decisions at the right moment and as I said, make sure the next step is a sure-footed one in this crisis. You've been uh, very firm saying that you're following the scientific advice and talking about what scientists have been telling, telling you. So why won't you publish that scientific advice and even just the names of the scientists who are giving you the advice? Well, SAGE do release um, uh, their advice subsequent, as normally about a couple of weeks down the track, so it's properly um, tested and carefully uh, checked before being put out. We don't release, as a matter of practice, the names of all the members of SAGE because the risk of them being subject to pressure, undue influence, things like that. But I don't think, Sophie, realistically, uh, you can say there's been a lack of transparency. We've had the Chief Scientific Advisor, Sir Patrick Vallance, the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Chris Whitty, along with politicians like me, standing up on a daily basis answering the questions setting out their advice and making sure that we communicate as clearly as possibly to the public what that advice is um, it's interesting saying that I'm saying that you're not being transparent you were saying a bit earlier that um, if you did one thing then journalists would criticize you and look I'll level you with you you know the poll out by Sky News last week showed that people trust politicians like you a lot more than journalists like me when it comes to these dealing with the coronavirus epidemic. But at the same time, you know, my job is to try and get answers. And it does feel like on some things, we're not really sure what those answers are. You know, we don't know what the plan is or what the thinking is around the lockdown exit. We don't know who's on the committee of scientists. We don't get that scientific advice uh, until uh, it's slightly delayed. You know, you can't blame us for ans asking these questions. And it does feel as if there are some things that you're not telling us. Why not? Oh, I don't blame uh, you, Sophie. I've come on the show because I embrace that scrutiny. I've done the press conferences because it's critically important. We welcome Parliament getting back up and running responsibly with the social distancing and the technology to do it responsibly. We embrace that scrutiny. It's really important. I'm just also explaining to you, as, as, as along with the things that we have set out, why there are certain things that if we jump the gun, they would be irresponsible and precarious. The stage we're at with this virus, and I talked about the uh, achievement that we've had with the public, with the NHS, in flattening the curve as we come through the peak, keeping NHS capacity so that it isn't overwhelmed, and that's really important. And the, the, the delicate stage we're at is if we ease up too soon, we risk a second spike of the virus. That would create unnecessary deaths, and that would be deeply irresponsible. Uh, and at the same time, it would precipitate probably another lockdown and uh, as Andrew Bailey the governor of the Bank of England has said that would not just be damaging for the economy because it would prolong the pain but it would be a blow to public confidence so we do have to take the right steps at the right time I, I we no one is clamoring more to get on to the second phase where we can not just safely and responsibly protect people's lives but preserve our way of life but I'm also acutely conscious because I'm talking to Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance and getting that advice that we need to make sure footed steps and do the responsible thing at the right time and so uh, we're monitoring the evidence very carefully uh, we're doing all the homework on all of those areas of what the second phase would look like uh, and we'll make sure that we can do so and announce the detail of it where it's clear and it's reassuring and it's, uh, it's articulating the detail in a way that's responsible and doesn't actually end up creating mixed messages and I think that's the responsible thing that politicians like me should do. Now testing 
Testing is going to be absolutely critical uh, in the months ahead. The Mail on Sunday report said that British scientists have developed a new immunity test to effectively find out if you've had coronavirus, if you have antibodies to it. Um, apparently, ministers have ordered 50 million of them. Is that true? I think we're certainly looking um, at, at that. The, uh, the antibody test is important because it can tell whether you've had the virus. There's also the swab test which t says whether you currently have got the virus. Uh, we're looking at all of these measures to manage and try and bring an end to the coronavirus. There are other things as well. We're looking at, at the possibility of a vaccine. That's not likely to come to fruition uh, this year, but it could be very important if we get multiple waves of coronavirus globally down the track. There's also therapeutics and drugs. Uh, it's not talked about quite so much in the media, but that's an important avenue for us to really explore and to drive forward. Because, of course, if we could get the death rate from this virus down, uh, and it actually, for most people, and uh, the overwhelming majority of people, started to resemble something more like flu, it would be much more manageable. So whether it's the tests, uh, the therapeutics and the vaccines, we're making sure we're driving forward as swiftly and as, uh, and as carefully as possible. So we're in the best place in the medium term to be able to manage and uh, eliminate this crisis for good and in a sustainable way and in a responsible way. Uh, testing, of course, uh, whether or not you have coronavirus at that particular moment will also be very important um, so that people can make sure that they isolate and, and trace anyone they come into contact with. Now, in just four days' time, we're supposed to be carrying out 100,000 of those tests every day. The latest figures show just 28,700 tests carried out in a 24-hour period. I mean, I'm no mathematician. Are you actually going to meet that? Well, you're right about that in terms of the latest figures for tests carried out, although it's a bit old now because as we come through the weekend, we've got new data. Our capacity for carrying out tests is now at 51,000 per day, so we've passed the halfway line to our target. And there's two things in the last week that really matter. And you always get the exponential uh, increase in a project like this in the last week as the capacity comes on tap. So with so the NHS the data, portal, sorry, that you we're making sure... Well, the new data will come out, um, uh, uh, so the, the data has always got a, a lag to it, but on Monday we'll get the updated data, and I think there's two things which have happened which will give us confidence that we're actually on track to meet the target. First of all, with the NHS portal, uh, we're making sure that people can access the test either through home kits, through any one of the 31 drive-through centres, and increasingly with uh, mobile uh, testing labs and the military are helping disseminate those, spread those across the country. The second thing is we focused initially on NHS workers, then on care workers. We've now broadened it to include all essential workers. And so I think we're going to see a big surge in the last week and we're on track to hit that target. Testing is really important, not just in the way uh, we've described before about eliminating the virus for good sustainably down the track, but also as we consider uh, the second phase, it can help us and give us more room for manoeuvre in terms of easing up on the measures because you can monitor very carefully who has and who hasn't got the virus. So it's really important. Now, there's been a lot of criticism, of course, um, well documented criticism, uh, saying the government was too slow to get testing up and running uh, in the previous months. Uh, another area where we've been slower than other countries is quarantining people who travel to the United Kingdom. There's reports out today that uh, in the Sunday Telegraph that that is going to change at some point. So can you just be clear, um, is the government going to start limiting um, flights coming to the United Kingdom or quarantining people once they arrive uh, in the United Kingdom? So first of all, I don't accept your assertion that we've uh, been too slow to act. As I mentioned before, we've taken the right measures at the right time because we want to capture the peak of the virus and flatten it uh, and make sure the NHS is able to cope at the right moment in time. If you go too early with your measures, and I think there'll be international experience when we're done with this crisis that will bear this out. If you go too early, you end up trying to come out of it too early and that risks the second spike. In relation to measures at the border in terms of people coming into the country, the advice so far has always been it will make almost no impact on the spread of the virus because of the decrease in the number of people um, travelling uh, and the fact that the transmission rate in, within the UK is high. But we've 
continually throughout tested this um, with the scientists and with uh, the chief medical officer to make sure that as the evidence changes or as we move to a second phase we're um, able to take any new measures that, that, that are necessary. So that's something that we will be looking at um, and it could include uh, the, the testing for people coming in, it could include uh, social distancing measures um, and we'll make sure as I said um, particularly as we consider any transition to a second phase that we're absolutely on top of the scientific evidence and are taking all the measures that are necessary to protect people's health, uh, to protect life, but also to preserve our way of life as we go forward economically and okay. socially. Now, um, we are running out of time, but you've been deputising for the Prime Minister while he uh, recovers. How is he? He's good. He's on good spirits. Um, he's uh, taken the time and taken the doctor's advice to, to rebuild his strength. He's going to be back at work full time, properly uh, at the helm on Monday. And it, as you can imagine, uh, with the prime minister, he's raring to go. Um, and I spoke to him. Uh, I've spoken to him every day this week. We've uh, made sure that he's abreast of everything that's going on. And we had a meeting at Chequers, and the chancellor joined, and various members of the top team. So I think he's right to have taken the time he did to make sure he can bounce back. Uh, but he's looking forward to getting back at. The, at the reins on Monday. OK, and now uh, you, of course, have been deputising for the Prime Minister, as I said. Um, you took over from the Prime Minister when he was incapacitated. It's the kind of thing that I'm sure that you never expect you will ever have to do uh, in the circumstances that you did. So I'm interested to know, you know, how did you find out that you were going to be doing this role? Who, who told you? And has it been difficult to balance, you know, the need to show leadership at this time of crisis but also, of course, not really wanting to, I guess, do anything that Boris Johnson wouldn't do. It is uh, look, an unprecedented situation. The Cabinet Secretary and uh, other officials uh, explained the situation to me. Um, my first uh, instinct was obviously to be worried for the Prime Minister, but I knew he was in great hands uh, at St Thomas's. And frankly, uh, with the country going through this crisis on its knees uh, and with the Prime Minister stricken with a deadly virus, uh, the only thing I was focused on is stepping up to the plate and not letting my Prime Minister down and trying not to let my country down. And uh, the last three weeks have been a challenge, but we've had a great team effort in Cabinet. Everyone's been focused on what they've got to do. And I think that they've performed exceptionally well. It's a team effort. Uh, and of course, the country, uh, I, I think there's been a real strong unity of purpose as we go through the, this very difficult period, particularly with the milestone of 20,000 deaths. And so, I mean, I can only pay tribute to those on the front line and the British public for following the guidance and stepping up to the plate. Um, and my role is uh, uh, a small part of that. Well, I think we'd certainly uh, share in the tribute to those uh, on the front line. Um, just very finally, um, there's unconfirmed rumours and reports that Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, has died. Now, you're Foreign Secretary, so I'm sure that you're best placed to, you know, try and answer this question if anyone can. Do you know if he's dead? No, we, the, the reports are uncorroborated. I've seen the international media reports, but we don't have any uh, verified uh, state of play on that yet. But obviously, we're following it very carefully, those reports.